welcome everyone. So, um, yes, yeah, so my name is Luke Adcock. I'm the service manager for the Matthew Project Young People Services. Um, so we have two services. So we have the UCAN service and we have the Unity service. I'll explain more about the UCAN service um, sort of as I do the presentation. Uh, but primarily, we're a substance misuse um, charity in Norfolk, commission service uh, to support young people who um, are worried or concerned about their own substance use. So that is the Unity service. And then we have the service which works with children and young people under the age of 19, uh, where they're worried or concerned um, about a family member's substance use, usually um, a parental uh, substance user. Um, so that's kind of our main sort of remit of what we do. Um, but I'll explain a little bit more about that um, as we go through the presentation. Um, so today really is focused on thinking about um, the impact of someone else's substance use. So we're not just talking about, um, we're not sort of focusing on the user themselves, but how that can impact other people. And then the link between substance use and neurodiversity as well. Um, so substance use can impact a whole range um, of people and communities. This is just one diagram, I guess, to kind of demonstrate that. So it's really important that when we're working um, in terms of substance use, that we don't just focus on the substance user and the issues that they're having and the problems and making sure we get them help, but actually kind of the wider community and how we can um, help those people um, as well, um, as it shows there uh, on the diagram. So in terms of um, substance use, in terms of its uses and its kind of risks, it generally fits um, within a spectrum. This is just one example of how the spectrum um, works in terms of substance use. It doesn't necessarily follow this path as well. So it generally fits into kind of four um, categories. So you've got the kind of the, um, what we might be seen as the beneficial use. Um, so small quantities of things like um, caffeine that people might use just to kind of wake themselves up in the morning. Um, give them a little bit more alertness as well. Um, so that's kind of what we're looking at in terms of kind of that beneficial use or obviously kind of medications as well, um, prescriptions and things like that. Um, then we might move into kind of the more um, sort of casual use or recreational use, some people might refer it to it as, uh, where people are using substances um, and they kind of feel like there's no kind of significant um, issue for them. They don't recognise any problems um, and they're quite happy um, with their substance use. Um, then we've got the kind of more problematic use where it kind of starts to kind of impact them, whether it's their physical health, emotional health, um, start seeing um, kind of issues in terms of kind of community and other people um, around them as well. Um, and then you've got the kind of more dependence use which, uh, where um, drug use have a kind of significant issue on people's lives. Um, and it's not to say that just because someone starts beneficial use or um, kind of is using occasionally or recreationally, it doesn't mean that they all kind of follow this path all the way um, to chronic dependence or black problematic use. Actually, um, it's a very small percentage of people who kind of end up in this kind of significant um, issues in terms of kind of substance um, use. Um, and obviously people can move backwards and kind of forwards with on this spectrum um, as well. Um, so it's not kind of linear, it doesn't just go from one to another, but that's kind of breaking up into kind of um, stages. Um, so I'm here to talk about um, substance use and kind of neurodiversity. And some of you may have heard the, um, heard the term dual diagnosis, which kind of really links to um, conditions where people have a mental health issue um, and a substance misuse issue, because often that, that will go um, hand in hand. Um, but we really want to kind of broaden that out now um, and use the kind of term co-occurring conditions. So that does include kind of mental health, but also can include um, neurodiversity as well. There's often lots of other issues in, interlinked with substance use um, and neurodiversity um, is one of those as well. And when we talk about co-occurring conditions, uh, we include a whole kind of spectrums in terms of neurodiversity, uh, mental health and substances themselves as well. Um, so neurodiversity can interact with problematic substance use. Um, people often use it in terms of kind of self-medication, so a bit like sort of mental health. Um, and often they'll use it to kind of mask their uh, own behavior and kind of fit in amongst kind of neurotypical um, people as well. So that's some of the reasons why people uh, may use substances in terms of uh, neurodiversity as well. So for example, someone with um, autism, 
finds kind of social situations quite uh, difficult. Um, this can often make people feel quite stressed, quite anxious. Um, and this might lead for some people to come reliant on substances in those situations, which is what I said earlier about kind of masking their kind of feelings and want into kind of that um, kind of that fit in with other people as well. Um, generally, kind of young people want to fit in in certain situations. That might be an underlying factor as well. Um, but someone who's neurodiverse um, may be more likely to sort of seek that kind of uh, substance to help them fit in um, with others if they're feeling quite um, isolated as well. Um, so some of the other reasons why people might um, develop problematic use, kind of that need for routine, that repetitiveness, um, the lack of kind of support services for them um, to help them manage their emotions, um, and um, kind of a late diagnosis as well. There's lots of issues about people getting diagnosed with neurodiversity. Um, so that might be kind of, um, yeah, prolong that kind of issues for them and they might seek support or they might seek substances as a way of coping um, with that. And also about kind of physical um, conditions as well. Um, so ADHD, um, so again, um, within our service in terms of young people, there's a significant number of young people who have ADHD who are also um, using substances and has issues um, along that, uh, with that. Um, that kind of impulsivity as well in terms of um, experiment with drugs, um, they kind of um, not being able to assess situations as well um, and, and sense the, the kind of, uh, assess kind of the risks as well. Um, and yeah, so there's some of the reasons as well why people might go on to use uh, substances and they um, yeah, have kind of like problematic use as well. But just because they do have someone has ADHD, it doesn't mean that they will go on to use substances. It just means in terms of kind of uh, the neurodiversity aspect, there's a greater risk of kind of what they're um, seeking. And a number of young people we know um, self-medicate um, on various substances. Um, there's a whole shortage of ADHD medication at the minute, so the delay, the delay um, in terms of getting a diagnosis is leading um, young people to kind of self-medicate on uh, drugs and um, alcohol as well. Um, so um, the timing is really important. So the younger someone gets um, diagnosis, the um, more likely they are to have more positive um, outcomes. Um, so that's really important that we have that kind of early um, intervention as well. Um, and treatment might present, uh, prevent the onset of substance use as well. So managing that kind of um, behaviour for them to have an understanding of how um, yeah, their neurodiversity affects them um, is really uh, kind of important as well. OK, so what are some of the barriers? Um, so there's barriers to access and services. Uh, we know that services are stretched. Um, and it can be, like I said before, just in terms of delaying diagnosis is huge at the moment. Um, and for kind of mental health, um, at the moment in terms of young people, in terms of substance use, we can see people pretty quickly. So uh, we can normally see people within a couple of weeks. Um, but we're a kind of primarily a substance misuse, um, obviously, service. But we too try and bring in other kind of professionals to work alongside us. Um, and there, an example of that, isn't it, that not sort of multiple needs on just can be met just, one, just by one service. There's lots of services that need to be um, involved. Um, and similarly, lots of presentations um, in terms of kind of mental health as well. It could be kind of, um, yeah, uh, links between them and kind of misdiagnosis as well. And Norfolk and being a rural um, county as well, lots of challenges in terms of accessing um, support, accessing treatment, um, particularly, yeah, in rural areas, um, it's very um, challenging sometimes um, as well. So we're going to move on to think about um, kind of how this kind of can impact other people. So we're just going to think about um, kind of parents, particularly focusing on um, young people at the moment in terms of the kind of face of reality that their um, son, daughter um, has issues with substance use. Um, a lot of the time it can come as a shock. Young people um, are quite good at keeping secrets from their um, parents. Um, I'm sure you kept secrets from your parents um, when you were younger and you were quite, uh, quite good at it as well. Um, so when it does come to light, it can be really sort of challenging um, for um, parents to deal with this um, and it can come as a real kind of shock. Um, and though parents will go through different stages, um, and parents will think about um, 
like trying to blame perhaps other people or searching for particular regions. So there's a lots of questioning uh, that parents um, will go through. Um, and they may blame their kind of own children or they may blame kind of other children um, for um, getting their son or daughter involved in substances. So they might look for other aspects um, away from themselves or the son as the reasons why. So there's um, a bit of a um, denial as well with that. Um, but some parents will have that, it's my fault, will blame themselves, think about what they could have done differently. Um, some parents won't understand if they're grown up in a kind of a situation where it's a or family environment where it's very much kind of anti anti drugs. They might really find it really difficult to understand why their son or daughter would use drugs. Um, again, that kind of feeling of like they've let um, their child um, down and thinking about how they perhaps could have been um, a better parent. So part of it is helping uh, kind of parents move on. So there's kind of that acceptance. Um, there is a problem um, and how to kind of deal with it and knowing that they need to kind of move forward with that. Um, and sometimes positive moments can feel negative that if they can access their um, son or daughter support or um, kind of treatment, sometimes they might be having, knowing they're having kind of confidential conversations with another, with someone else, with a professional. And that can be quite difficult um, for parents because they don't fully know what's going on. But often um, we'll find that young people seek sort of support and comfort and having kind of um, sort of conversations away um, from the family. Um, and then it's about getting um, parents to kind of move on and accessing their own support, and that's really important as well. Um, so parents can seek their own support, whoever um, feels most appropriate to do that as well, um, often from someone separate um, from who's supporting their child, so it really kind of um, separates that. Um, and they have to need to think about how they kind of manage their own emotions, and they'll be going up and down through the process of their uh, son or daughter um, getting support. And just being able to uh, adapt to kind of different um, kind of relationships, adapting to the kind of different situations as well. So, what is the impact in terms of uh, children and young people in terms of kind of substance misuse? And can um, substance use cause neurodiversity? So, the impact um, that substance misuse can have um, on anyone can start right through um, conception and we need to think about how that starts. So when we think about alcohol, um, for example, um, there's guidelines in terms of drinking alcohol during um, pregnancy, which is there um, for a reason. So the kind of guidelines, um, if someone's planning uh, pregnancy, is not to drink alcohol at all. It keeps the risk to the baby at an absolute minimum. Um, drinking pregnancy can lead to long-term harm to the baby, um, and we'll come on to that um, in a moment. Um, and the risk of harm to the baby is likely to be low if a woman has drunk only a small amount of alcohol as well. So I'm not going to go into great um, detail. Some of you may have heard this before, but fetal, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. So it's a kind of a range of disorders um, which only occurs where there's confirmation uh, or whether a mother has drunk alcohol during pregnancy. Um, and there's no way of knowing how much alcohol could cause the impact to the unborn baby. And it all depends on the level, the stages at which a baby is developing um, in the womb as well. Um, so the only way of making sure this doesn't happen is not to drink alcohol during pregnancy. But unfortunately for um, some young people, um, that if a mum consumes alcohol during pregnancy, then it could potentially cause fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, which again is a range of um, dis disorders as well. And international studies suggest between one and five percent of people may have this condition, which obviously seems like quite a lot, doesn't it? Um, and it's very hard to get um, a diagnosis because you need confirmation for the mother that they've been drinking alcohol. And that might be difficult for a mum to admit that during pregnancy they were drinking alcohol and that's caused their young person to have this condition. So in terms of it being um, under um, report it, it's very difficult to get um, to sort of get significant figures that's why it's kind of um, sort of suggested um, suggested numbers so um, in terms of fetal alcohol spectrum um, disorders these are some of the issues that it could potentially um, cause so movement balance vision and hearing 
um, learning, such as um, problems about thinking, concentration, and memory, um, kind of managing those kind of emotionals, those developing those social skills, um, that hyperactivity and impulse control, uh, communication, such as problems with speech, and even can have problems with the joints, muscles, bones, organs kind of developing as well. So it can have a really significant um, impact on uh, young people as well. Um, and these problems are permanent. Um, and again, early treatment support can help limit the impact on a child's social life. So there's no kind of medication that can help with this. Um, and I think one of the things that we've, fi we've found is that actually, if you look at that list, you could, you know, that could be someone who's got ADHD, couldn't it? Or um, potentially autism. So I think there's potentially quite a bit of misdiagnosis um, as well in terms of fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. Um, but I'm just going to play you um, a clip now, or um, a sound, and it comes from uh, Race Across the World. It's one of the original um, series, so I think we're on series five or six now. But in series two, um, there was a um, lad who did have um, fetal alcohol spectrum, uh, um, F FAS, um, sorry. And, and it just shows you that even though there are kind of challenges with this, that people can go on and kind of do things that they um, want to do. Most of the time I'm enjoying the race, but then quite a lot of the time I'm not. And it's just like you go through highs and lows. And I think with eight weeks, I will struggle. Going from Panama to Colombia on the boat, going through all the islands and the beautiful water, it was absolutely amazing. But then stuff like doing the nine hour, 10 hour bus ride, I get so bored because there's nothing to do, and I can't deal with that. So it's not pleasant. Do you think it's got anything to do with your ADHD? It probably does. I don't know. I, I've never been able to explain why I'm anything. When I adopted Sam, when he was six months old, he was very hyper and he was quite disruptive at, at nursery. And in fact, a nursery owner said, did his birth mother drink? And I said, well, yeah, she did, why? And she said, oh, I've just seen children a bit like Sam. We went off and did a little bit of research and found this condition called fetal alcohol disease or fetal alcohol effects. And it was just like reading a story about Sam. You still get frustrated, don't you? Well, I get frustrated that I can't explain it. Basically, how it affects the brain is the wiring is just off. If you said, you know, don't touch that, it's hot, he would touch it. I'm sorry that you're struggling with it a bit, so try and get things right and try to prioritise what's important. We're going to Medellin. Um, is there anything that you'd like to do there? Well, that is where Pablo Escobar is, isn't it? Well, was, yeah. Well, I'd really love to go to oh, tour of... OK, well, um, that's doable. Can you do that? Shake on it. Shake on it. OK, so it's really about kind of being able to kind of manage that um, kind of behaviour. Um, and actually, if you've got the right support in place and the right understanding that can really help um, young people through kind of adolescence into um, kind of adulthood manage kind of those kind of behaviours and for them to have an um, understanding of why they are um, who they are. Um, and it's important for sort of us to say, just because someone's got um, co-occurring conditions, um, it doesn't mean that they can't uh, parent effectively. It just means that there needs kind of more support um, in place as well. And all I've got on here is just to show you kind of the different um, elements of how sort of young people um, could be impacted um, in terms of that. So family, social relationships and identity issues, trying to work out who they are um, as a person, um, can have a really significant impact on them. Obviously, if they're in an environment where there is um, substance misuse taking um, kind of place, they're really kind of in, um, yeah, unsafe. So um, they need to kind of be supported and helped um, through that and safety plan through that as well. Um, Education um, and cognitive ability, so the ability to kind of learn um, if they're kind of um, kind of worried about what's going on at home, can't concentrate properly, um, if they're kind of really kind of struggling to kind of communicate that, they can have a significant impact on their education, therefore uh, their life in the future. Um, we've already mentioned kind of that emotional behaviour development as well, um, not getting the right kind of support through that. Um, 
And then in terms of kind of poverty, deprivation, um, and generally inadequate accommoda uh, accommodation, that's going to have, a, again, significant impact um, on those young people. Um, and then obviously you've got physical and emotional abuse or neglect as well, um, unfortunately. So if there's substance misuse taking place kind of in the home, um, that can have a significant um, impact on the child's life in terms of their um, kind of safety as well. Um, and then, yeah, so difficult, more likely to experience difficulties at school. So that might be um, struggling to make friends, uh, could be bullying, more likely to be involved in antisocial behaviour and then go on to develop substance misuse problems um, themselves as well. So what could help young people um, in these sort of situations? So um, making sure there's the right support, particularly from school. School often provides a really safe place and that kind of consistency uh, for young people, um, which they don't have at home if their parents are substance user and has lots of other uh, sort of conditions as well. So that real consistent approach is really important. Um, making sure there is people within their adult um, you know, and a safe sort of adult that they can kind of communicate with in terms of kind of risk and safety planning, knowing what they need to do or who they can talk to when things get difficult um, at home. Uh, making sure the appropriate services are in place as well and the right services. Um, families and young people often get overwhelmed with the various um, services. So it's making sure that the right services are right in, uh, in place for the right things. Um, Somewhere for young people just to be alone with their friends is really important. Some of the young people that we work with feel like they miss out on their kind of childhood or experiences. Um, so trying to connect them to kind of community groups of that sport, art, dance groups, anything that can help them um, connect with the kind of community is really um, important as well. And for them to identify their own dreams and goals. A lot of young people, when they speak to us about their kind of situation, their family life, um, they can't think of kind of any aspirations of what they want to do because they feel a bit stuck in their environment and they've seen their parents go through this and they feel that's the course um, set out for them. So it's really important to, for these young people to actually identify things that they could achieve. Um, and we've had lots of positive kind of outcomes of young people going off to sixth form, going off to university, getting into employment. So it's kind of making sure that young people still believe that they can um, achieve and thinking about things that they can control. So often young people in these environments don't feel like they've got any kind of control um, in their life. Um, as they're kind of growing up. Um, so it's really important to think about how, what elements of the life that they can um, control as well and celebrate um, any successes as well. So what we try and do, or young people in those situations, um, is trying to kind of work towards some of these things. So it's like thinking about how things are affecting their um, health and wellbeing and what we can do to achieve that. Um, a number of young people can really impact their confidence and self-esteem. So again, thinking about um, how you can kind of build that. Um, again, identity, really struggle with that. Young people don't quite know where they kind of fit in, who they are, being pulled between kind of friendship groups and fam you know, families as well. That can be really challenging for young people don't like what their um, parents are doing in terms of their substance misuse find it really hard if they're struggling in terms of kind of mental health or neurodiversity. So it's a real struggle for young, young, young people to work out who they um, are. Making sure engaging in education, which we've already talked about. Keeping safe and again, feeling like they've got control about their own safety and who they need to go to or what they need to do. So it's working on kind of safety plans. Building those kind of positive kind of relationships in the communities we just discussed. Um, and, and overall, what we're trying to do is kind of build that kind of resilience to be able to cope with ever changing um, situations. So in terms of kind of building family support, making sure there's absence of domestic violence, making sure there's effective support for the um, parents as well. So if there's substance misuse and mental health problems, making sure they're getting support. Um, Having fun times together is really um, important as well. Again, parents will need to increase their own kind of confidence, self-esteem, um, helping them sort out if there's any kind of money uh, worries. Accessing treatment for their own substance use. Um, if a whole family is getting support, that's really important just so they can see everyone is trying to um, yeah, get support um, as well. Bringing about kind of communication, sometimes we might act as uh, advocates for young people, but trying to bring around that kind of communication um, is really important. Acknowledging there's an issue um, in the first place um, and making sure that kind of young people's um, thoughts and feelings uh, are put first. So where there are issues in terms of um, substance misuse in the family, um, that 
the children are put first and their safety and thoughts or feelings um, as well. Just some more kind of considerations. Um, again, uh, making sure you work together with other organisations to bring everyone together so everyone knows what they're doing as well to make sure plans are kind of robust. Um, making sure that people, when they work with young people, have the skills directly working with young people as well. It's not always about what people know and their knowledge. It's about the skills about being able to connect and engage with young people. It's important not setting families up to fail, setting realistic goals they feel like they can um, achieve and need to understand substance misuse and neurodiversity as well. So again, it's not having expert knowledge about every single substance, um, but just under, having to understand about how that can impact um, young people as well, or the family. Um, and thinking about who else within the family network can support um, kind of young people and other family members as well, if there's anyone appropriate there, um, leading on kind of that support um, network already. Um, and then um, seeing lives from a child's point of view as well. So I'm just going to play you another um, clip. And I guess, again, this kind of shows you how far and wide um, substance abuse can impact people. Um, and I want you to guess um, who this is who's talking. So I've got memories of just, like, the disappointment of relapse. Because, you know, like, you're clean and suddenly everything is just unstable and it's all, it all reverts back to the old days. And it was just, like, that was really hard. When you love someone so much, you just want them to be clean. It was, it was difficult, you know? I remember you being really angry. You, you were angry with me. And, and, had, and had, every right, had every right to be angry as well. You'd just be sleepy all the time. You'd just be kind of, like, vacant. It, it was hard to kind of, like, come up and talk to you about my day or, you know, have, like, mm. a cuddle. No. You, you can't really love anyone properly when you're intoxicated with opiates. It just kills all feelings. It just kills, numbs you sort it of It just thing. numbs you completely, yeah. I can only imagine how difficult that must have been for you and, you know, the, con the constant lying and, de and denying what was going on. I remember you to say, I'm just popping around the shop to get some milk. It was, it was like your... It was like your code word for, like, I'm going to go and score some gear. Like, and you may as well just said, I'm just going to go and score some gear, cos I knew when you said, like, I'm just popping around the shop for, to get some milk. You know, you never, you never came back with milk, but it was like I just I knew that, that that's what it meant, mm. and it was hard because I suppose I wish I, was, I always just didn't want to let you go. I always used to think, why can't you be clean? Ain't ain't we enough at home? You know, me and mm. me and Mum and George and stuff. I can only imagine how difficult that must have been for a little boy. I mean, I, I can remember thinking at times is like, the only one suffering here is me. You know, I'm the one addicted to drugs. They're, they're just getting on with their lives. Well, that, now, when I think about it, it's like, how selfish and how deluded that you can be to think that. At the time, did you know you had, had a mental health problem? No, I didn't know, but there was always, there was, you know, when drugs and alcohol come along for me at the age of 13, it really did, I feel it kind of, in some level probably saved my life for a while, you know, because it medicated how I was feeling. Wow. So, but of course I didn't know that. I didn't know that until... Save your life in what way? What do you mean? Well, I don't know whether I would have, you know, been able to carry on really without, you know, how I felt, so... I can't believe that. I didn't know. Well, it's I just thought so... you were like, I thought you kind of got... I thought you were... I thought it was the drugs that messed up your life, but it sounds like even before that, like, you were still really struggling emotionally and stuff, and you were... Yeah, I think I was already showing kind of mental health issues really young. But, you know, my granddad suffered from depression. My dad suffered from depression. My mum still suffers from depression. I've suffered from depression. You know, it's... I understand. I almost sort of understand, like, because of the life you went through, the feelings that you must have had as a kid growing up, so you just self-medicated. I always used to think... You know, the drugs are more important, or the drug you you know you love the drugs more. And I've I've realised it's not like that. You know how 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 could you in that moment where you were you were you were self medicating with heroin? How could you be loving and, and affectionate towards me? Like it just wasn't it wasn't possible. No, I'm lucky you still talk to me when when I, you know, thank God we have what we have today. But yeah, I think that you know I need to stay clean so that you know I, you're.
so that your kids never have to see me like that. Okay, do you know who that is? That's uh, Joe Wicks. Yeah, so um, for those of you who don't know, yeah, he, so he, his, um, obviously, uh, as you just heard, his dad was a, yeah, heroin user. Um, and it's really interesting it's because his dad had no idea that um, Joe knew what was going on, but Joe understood what was going on, but he wasn't able to kind of communicate that or the kind of impact. It's really interesting. I find it quite interesting. I wonder if um, his way of coping was to get into kind of kind of fitness and stuff like that as well. Um, but it shows like, I think some of the things that we find is, you know, when parents might say in terms of kind of their struggles, they say, well, it's not impacting, um, doesn't impact my children or, you know, they don't know what's going on, but actually um, most young people do know and it, does impact them, even though if they're not necessarily um, showing that. Um, so, in terms of what um, one of the services that we provide, our main what our main services in terms of we support young people who have been um, impacted by parental substance misuse, and again, often it's those with co-occurring conditions. Um, so, any young person or child under age of 19 affected by um, a family member's a substance use. Um, but it could be a significant other as well. It doesn't always have to be a parent, but someone significant um, in their life. Um, yeah, and we do need to get to, uh, sort of consent from a young person. They need to um, understand what's happening in their life and want to get um, support um, as well. Um, it's tailored, so it's one-to-one um, -one support. Um, and we meet the, try and meet the needs of the young person, whatever they come um, to us needing support kind of um, with. Um, and we meet young people where they feel sort of safe, uh, where they feel most comfortable, often out in the community, often it's kind of within a school setting where they feel kind of safe um, and secure. Kind of flexible in terms of our support as well. Um, and so it can be a variety of ways. We, it's a, you know, it's a face-to-face -face service, but sometimes you might just do catch-up um, meetings through telephone calls, texts, um, kind of online um, as well. So there's various ways we can get in contact and support um, young people, but primarily it's face-to-face. -face. Um, and we do obviously work with other agencies as well. So if there's parental substance misuse, uh, we'll work with kind of CGL, um, which is the adult treatment service um, in uh, Norfolk. Um, so part of our work is really to offer a space um, to aid understanding about their kind of experiences. Again, our main remit is kind of building that kind of resilience. Um, we're aware that we can't be around all the time, so it's working on those skills for young people to be able to cope with those kind of situations and be able to kind of keep safe and know what to do. Um, looking about how to can link with kind of positive activities. So we'll run some of those kind of skill-based activities um, ourselves. Um, and also we're aware that we don't just want to drop off um, once we've finished support, but we'll offer kind of touch base um, support afterwards to kind of check in after they finish, just to see how they're doing, see if the situation's changed and kind of go through some of the strategies that they've got in place if that's what they, um, that's what they need as well. Um, I'll just skip that. Um, so in terms of kind of um, that kind of touch base aftercare support is about, again, building on that resilience they've already um, accessed through our support, um, building on coping skills, stress management, um, safety planning, problem solving, access to other services, and trying to access um, kind of community groups as well. Um, and they can continue to have sort of access to kind of the skills groups um, as well. Um, in terms of kind of professionals, um, again, we can provide kind of consultation for professionals so if they were kind of worried or wasn't sure about um, something that was going on within a, within a kind of family home, then we can offer that support. Uh, or if a young person perhaps doesn't want to engage in our service, but already connected to a professional, then we can offer some guidance and advice to that kind of professional as well, and can, so they can sort of offer that support um, themselves as well. Um, and again, just kind of that collaboration work is really um, important as well. Uh, for young people over age 13, uh, we have a live chat sort of Monday to Thursday between 4 and 7 where they can uh, chat to um, a worker as well if they need um, that as well. Um, and that's all our contact details. So, um, yeah, thank you very much for listening. That's the end of the presentation. Um, I don't know if anyone's got any questions. Um, can I ask, do you have any like work in the community? Do you offer any catch-up 
catch up for young people in the community, like a drop in, or are you out in the community? Yeah, so we're not. So mainly, our when we receive referrals, it is mainly a, it's kind of one to one. So I guess we don't particularly do drop ins, but we do various kind of events. So it's sort of connected kind of with the family um, hub. So we've got various things like that as well. Um, we do um, in terms of kind of skills based groups and activities. They generally already have to be in our service. So we'd have to we'd have to kind of assess them in terms of um, coming into those groups as well. Um, at the moment, we don't really um, sort of do any drop-ins as such at the moment. Um, we have done before in terms of, um, yeah, so we have done before in terms of kind of school groups, um, places like the YMCA, hostels, that type of thing as well. We don't um, at the moment, because we're generally kind of more specific and more targeted in what we can um, do. So we don't quite offer the same range of stuff that we used to be able to, but yeah, good question. Yeah. Um, can you tell me what the um, training for uh, other professionals? Yeah. So, um, so part of what we do is we are part of um, the NSCP um, training. So we run the substance misuse in the family. So we do a day's um, training, which is sort of very much an extended version of what I've presented here today, particularly stuff about fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. So there's a more in depth um, about that. So it's, yeah, it's more about that. And then we can do kind of bespoke training as well. So, um, so for example, we've done some for like, um, if there's a kind of a social work team um, that need a bit of, um, would like a bit of training, and we can do some bespoke kind of training for those groups as well. So, um, and again, we can um, do it to kind of meet the needs and what the needs are for any kind of professionals. So that's gonna be quite flexible how we approach that. And if there's no more questions, I think that's the end. So thank you very much.